Um, so, uh, yeah, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, organizers, uh, not only for the invitation uh, to come, but uh, putting together such a, a wonderful uh, program uh, together with the staff. I uh, really had a, a wonderful time here. Um, so, yeah, I thought uh, today I'm going to try and tell you about some of our efforts to uh, look at the interplay between uh, F-electron uh, materials, uh, which are strongly correlated, uh, and, and hopefully have some consequences of their intersection with uh, topological uh, notions of topology. Um, and, and certainly this, this work is uh, being funded by the Department of Energy, and, and so I thank them for their support. Um, and then I'd also like to um, thank the, the people who actually did the work. Uh, we, we had a conversation last night, actually, where uh, there was a question to one of the theorists of when they last time, the last time they did an experiment was, and I was just glad the question didn't turn around and say, when was the last time I did an experiment? Because uh, uh, I'm actually very thankful to these collection of people uh, who, who actually do all the hard work, uh, and, and I'm just able to uh, present uh, their, their work to you. Um, okay, so the, the kinds of questions that, that we're asking um, are, are really uh, sort of, you know, where can we find that interplay between uh, correlations and, and topology? And these are the, the same kinds of questions that we've uh, been hearing throughout the week. Uh, you know, can we identify uh, correlation-induced topological phases uh, and, and see uh, that there are interaction-driven phase transitions between topological phases? Um, we're also asking whether we can find evidence of correlations uh, on uh, symmetry-protected uh, topological uh, surface states. Uh, and of course, for us, uh, you know, one of the holy grails would be to identify some kind of fractionalized topological state, uh, and, and we're motivated by the fact that these states exist. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, the example is the fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, and so we would love to try and identify, you know, where is the, the fractionalized version uh, of various other um, topological states, such as topological insulators? Uh, and, and we've heard uh, various efforts uh, uh, towards that uh, direction as well. Um, and, and so, you know, this was a, a version of, of a graph that was uh, shown earlier in the week. And, and so, um, you know, even though uh, Charlie nicely showed us that there are still interesting questions down here uh, with regards to topology, um, we, we are indeed motivated by the fact that uh, if we can crank up the, the strength of the spin orbit coupling and, and crank up the strength of interactions, that perhaps we'll get this interplay between strong correlations uh, and, and various topological uh, aspects of topology. Um, and in this area called the Wild Frontier, uh, in, this, in this Slack document, um, we would argue that 4F and 5F materials are very natural places to look uh, for these kinds of things, precisely because you have, you're sitting at the bottom of the periodic table, and so you have strong spin orbit coupling, uh, and because the F orbitals are uh, very, very constrained in real space, they have strong uh, Coulomb interactions. So I was going to present today kind of uh, four different things, uh, and. And sort of the, the first two uh, I will present are basically examples that I think we are sort of exploring in, in the right sort of areas of phase space. Uh, and namely, I will show that in the uranium ferromagnets, uh, we have a very large and tunable uh, Berry curvature uh, in this material, which we can probe with transverse response functions. Uh, and then in this uh, topological condo insulator, uh, the, the show evidence for these heavy surface states uh, that we saw uh, evidence for uh, earlier in the week. And then I'll present sort of two uh, results that actually I don't really understand very much uh, and, and will we'll greatly uh, appreciate any input on these ideas. And, and the first is sort of mapping out a phase diagram with, uh, with stress, uniaxial stress in serum rhodium minium 5. It looks a lot like um, what I think uh, one would expect for a topological superconductor. And, Maybe that's, uh, there's no relation, um, but uh, uh, I'd like to pose that as a question. And then finally, I'll end with a material that was inspired by us trying to look for the intersection between correlations and topology. Uh, and uh, in some ways, it just looks like a trivial insulator, uh, but DFT says it should be a metal, and we're very confused by that fact. Okay, so uh, the first topic, uh, with uranium cobalt uh, aluminum doped with ruthenium, um, 
So this is a material, uranium cobalt aluminum uh, is a paramagnet that sits very close to a quantum critical point uh, at ambient pressure. If you start alloying the material with ruthenium, uh, you get a nice robust ferromagnetic phase, the Curie temperature is up to about 60 Kelvin. And we thought, okay, this is maybe now a good place to start looking uh, for this intersection between correlation and topology, uh, precisely because it's uranium based, so we have the strong spin orbit coupling, strong Coulomb interactions. The uraniums also sit on a Kagame, distorted Kagame lattice, uh, and so we have uh, aspects of uh, frustration uh, in, in that regard, and, and so that might help enhance sort of uh, the kind of flat band nature uh, of the material. Um, it's ferromagnetic, so we have the broken time reversal symmetry uh, that, that we need, and then just for good measure, it's also non-centrosymmetric. And there was sort of previous evidence that, in fact, uh, you have a uh, fairly sizable sort of Hall resistivity uh, in, in this material, uh, and so we thought, okay, this is maybe now a good place to, to see the anomalous response. And so is the material correlated? Uh, so, uh, you know, it is uh, to, to at least a moderate extent. So here's the specific heat as a function of T squared. Uh, it has, you know, a, a moderate Sommerfeld coefficient, 40 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. Uh, that's roughly a factor of three times larger uh, than you get just from the DFT calculation, so indicating that you do indeed have uh, some mass renormalization, uh, and that's further confirmed when you measure the resistivity versus temperature. You can uh, extract out a, a T-squared component to the resistivity at low temperatures, uh, and you get uh, sort of what you expect from the Kadowaki uh, woods ratio. Okay, so, so there is some, some presence of correlations in this material, and uh, now let's go and, and take a look at the transverse response functions. So, um, so indeed, this is a, a, an easy axis ferromagnet. Here's magnetization as a function of temperature. Uh, you see that basically the easy axis magnetization is along the C direction. Um, and so when uh, we plot magnetization versus field, you have this nice sort of hysteresis loop uh, that you would expect. Uh, and, and that allows you to extract out the anomalous component. Uh, whether we're looking at the Hall resistivity, uh, the Nernst coefficient, uh, or the thermal Hall conductivity, you can see at low temperatures these red curves here, also these nice uh, hysteretic loops, which allows us to extract out the anomalous contribution uh, to these quantities. Um, and, and so then the question is, okay, great, you have this, this anomalous contribution, and is it intrinsic or is it an extrinsic contribution? Uh, and we argue that it, it's most likely dominated by the intrinsic contributions, and we say that for three reasons. Uh, so the first being just the magnitude of the resistivity here, something of order 100 microohm centimeters. Uh, compared with other studies, this is sort of puts you kind of in this dirty metal regime. Uh, and it's always a little bit counterintuitive to me that sort of the dirtier material actually allows you to see the intrinsic component uh, more easily, uh, but indeed, uh, so, uh, you expect to be dominated by the intrinsic components uh, in, in a dirtier metal. So, so that's evidence number one. Um, then, uh, you know, we, we certainly, we have a large Hall angle, which, which you get just from plotting the, the value of the uh, Hall conductivity uh, here, which is uh, 1,000 inverse ohm centimeters, um, gives you a large Hall angle. And then if you take that Hall conductivity and, and plot it versus the, the longitudinal conductivity squared in this case, giving you sort of a, a comparison with a scattering rate, um, then you would sort of argue that basically uh, sort of in the limit where there's no scattering and you're just measuring the intrinsic contribution, in fact, this curve is, is relatively flat. And so we're we've hopefully dominated by the intrinsic piece uh, in that regard. Uh, admittedly, this is a very small dynamic range. so. So this is kind of, uh, kind of, well, in support of, but not maybe the most compelling evidence. But the, the, the piece of information that really convinced us was the Hall conductivity, the thermal Hall conductivity here plotted as a function of temperature in purple, um, matches, uh, has excellent agreement with that of the electrical conductivity converted into the thermal units just using the Wiedemann-Franz law. So the fact that the Wiedemann-Franz law is satisfied uh, it tells us that we uh, do not have any sort of extrinsic scattering processes, these, which we know basically affect heat and charge differently, uh, and, and so, so we wouldn't expect the Wiedemann-Franz law to hold 
up to temperatures of order 40 Kelvin if, there were, uh, if these terms were dominated by extrinsic scattering processes. And this, this type of argument was first uh, put forth by Cameron Beignet's group uh, in the Science Advances article a few years ago. Okay, so, so you know, I flashed quickly just that we, we had these response functions uh, in the transverse channel. We have anomalous contributions, and the question is, like, you know, are these sizable? And in fact, so here is now the anomalous Peltier coefficient. So this is just uh, basically the, the NERNs uh, put into to units that are sort of more uh, calculated more naturally uh, from the theoretical calculations, as well as the anomalous Hall conductivity uh, in the electrical channel. Uh, for a variety of materials. And, and our material here at 40 Kelvin uh, actually has really uh, an amazingly large Nernst and consequently Peltier coefficient uh, in this material uh, relative to these other sort of materials that are, are known to be these topological uh, um, semi-metal type of materials. Uh, and in fact, this sort of red dashed line here is, is a line that basically you would expect to somewhat be a limit, in fact, if this is now comparing uh, a, a thermal transport with a charge transport quantity, uh, if you expected your carriers basically just to carry sort of one unit of entropy uh, per charge, uh, that might be limited here at this line. And in fact, so we are extending sort of above this, we actually have sort of almost two units uh, of, of heat transport per, per charge. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of, uh, well, it's certainly peculiar uh, and, and uh, in contrast uh, to the, these other materials that, that are shown here as a function of temperature. Um, so, so how do we think about this? And, and the way we think about this now uh, is the fact that actually we're just kind of like overloaded with, with Berry curvature uh, in, in this material. Uh, and so in fact, Seva uh, Ivanov uh, in Sergei Savrasov's uh, group uh, calculated uh, the vial nodes that we would have in this system, uh, and we found that there were over 150 vial nodes within 60 milli electron volts of the Fermi energy. And so here's just the selection of these uh, vial nodes that you find here. Uh, and so, you know, this is obviously the opposite limit of just finding two, you know, well isolated vial nodes, um, but it shows that we can, we actually just have so much. Uh, sort of, you know, of these, these topological features uh, to work with, um, in part because the, the uranium bands, even in the DFT level, uh, are somewhat narrow, uh, and we expect correlations to renormalize this even further. And so, you know, just a, a naive plot of what the Hall conductivity would do here as a function of uh, shifting the chemical potential, uh, you can see that it will, will change dramatically, uh, and if your Hall conductivity is changing quickly as a function of energy, uh, just by the Mott relation, you expect a, a large um, uh, uh, response in the in the thermal power in the NERFs. Um And so, you know, even if the details here are wrong, I, I think you know we're we're in a good phase space uh, for for finding these things. So then, the the other aspect is that because this varies quickly with the with the chemical potential, we might expect this to be uh, a rather tunable uh, property of the material, and indeed. Uh, you can see now here is the Peltier coefficient uh, versus temperature as a function of doping. Uh, and basically, we, you can now see why I was showing data for the 20% doping. That's obviously where we had the biggest effect. Uh, but you can tune this uh, with, with doping uh, fairly substantially. Uh, and we have reasonable agreement with the Mott relation uh, if, if you just assume uh, that, that doping is actually changing the chemical potential. Um, Perhaps uh, another sort of uh, even slightly more dramatic example of the tunability of these uranium-based materials. Uh, here is uranium-3, ruthenium-4, aluminum-12. The uranium atoms again sit on a Kagame lattice in, in this material. Um, and uh, now with a magnetic field of 5 tesla, we, we just rotated the magnetic field uh, in, in the plane here uh, and found huge oscillations. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hopefully that won't happen again. <laughs> um, so, okay. Um, so then, uh, so yeah, this um, uh, distorted Kagame uh, lattice uh, is is now 
responsible. The fact that that's coupled with a, with a very flat band in this material uh, made this uh, so, so tunable uh, in, in the Berry curvature. And in fact, uh, just uh, the, a theoretical description uh, of just sort of uraniums uh, with, with a flat, uh, with the condo coupling to a flat band uh, was able to kind of reproduce uh, what, what we were able to find here. So, so I think this, this, this shows that the, the tunability is there for the F-electron materials uh, and, and certainly the presence of, of non-trivial uh, uh, Berry curvature, at least, uh, is found. Okay, so another nice example uh, is, is looking at uh, topologically protected surface states uh, in F-electron materials. And, we, we heard a beautiful uh, talk by Harry uh, just a, a couple days ago uh, that in this material, samarium hexaboride, you have these, uh, this is a topological condo insulator, uh, and the surface states uh, from the QPI are, are very heavy. Um, and so I just wanted to add kind of one thing to this, uh, and that's uh, by showing the thermal power as a function of temperature, the slope of the thermal power is inversely proportional to the Fermi energy. And so if these surface states are heavy, uh, this transport that's uh, where the surface state dominates the transport here at, at temperatures below uh, about three, uh, two, three Kelvin, uh, then in fact uh, this, this directly gives us a measure of the Fermi energy. Uh, and, and that shows good agreement uh, with, with the QPI. Um, so, but one thing that uh, then Harry I think would find difficult to do is actually then perform these measurements under pressure. Uh, and so that is something, though, with a transport measurement we are able to do. And so here's thermal power as a function of temperature measured at a few different pressures uh, before the, the, the system actually becomes metallic. Uh, and what, what you see here is that this slope uh, is basically unchanged uh, as a function of, of pressure. Uh, and so basically that's telling us that our Fermi energy is unchanged. Uh, and since the Fermi energy is just related uh, to the, the carrier density and the effective mass uh, in this way, uh, what we know is from Li Ling Sun's measurement of the Hall conductivity as a function of pressure, uh, we know that the carrier density actually increases with increasing pressure. Uh, and so that means that our effective mass actually uh, must also be increasing with increasing pressure. Uh, and so I think this is a nice example uh, that shows that basically you know, what we know is that pressure is actually collapsing this gap, uh, and, and what it shows is that the, the effective mass of the bands here is getting heavier uh, as we are closing this gap. So perhaps it's, it's maybe what you might expect, um, but it's a, it's a nice confirmation of this. Um, and why that might be important is that, well, if you start making these um, surface states heavier and heavier, you might hope to eventually be able to drive an instability uh, on those heavy surface states. Uh, but unfortunately, at, at least to date, uh, we've not been able to go to low enough temperatures or, or, or basically make the system heavy enough uh, so that we've been able to identify that. Um, but that is definitely sort of an, an interesting direction and, and something that, that pushes us uh, towards looking at these F-electron materials. Okay, so um, in my remaining time, I'd like to now tell you about sort of two uh, things. Uh, one is just sort of curious, and then one I, I really don't understand. So I'll, I'll start with the, the curious, uh, and that's the elastocaloric uh, measurements on serum rhodium minium 5. Uh, and as a point of sort of what's motivating this study, uh, I'm going to actually go back to uranium ditelluride, uh, and we heard a very nice talk from Dai uh, on, on Monday on this. Uh, and so in uranium ditelluride, uh, there are measurements of the Kerr effect as a function of temperature uh, that show an onset uh, of the, the Kerr response right at TC, which suggests that the, the superconducting state itself breaks time reversal symmetry. And, and so if you have a system that breaks time reversal symmetry, one way to do this is that you have a chiral uh, order parameter. So you have a two component order parameter. Um, and in this way, then uh, you would actually expect a phase diagram in general uh, to be able to tune you um, sort of between uh, the, the different uh, possible superconducting phases. Uh, and if, you know, if a system was tetragonal, right, so strontium ruthenate before the uh, um, uh, NMR measurements were, were revisited uh, was believed to be precisely this, that the tetragonal system now could be this chiral superconducting state. And then if you applied stress to actually break the symmetry between the system, you would actually drive it into sort of one of these uh, uh, two different uh, superconducting states. 
Um, now, UTE2 is orthorhombic, uh, and so it doesn't have this symmetry. And so, in fact, you know, just generically, you would kind of expect that you would be sitting here and expect to see two transitions. And this is the, the story of why two transitions uh, is actually a very important uh, point in, in the system of uranium ditelluride. Um, but still, you might expect that, well, okay, perhaps accidentally you were sitting here close, and in a lot of our systems, uh, we do see one transition. But then again, we expect to be able to split this transition. So, so that's the kind of motivation that we had. Um, and, and so we, we did uniaxial stress uh, on UTE2, uh, and, and there's a lot of data here. But basically, uh, the, the point was that uh, as we stressed the material, basically, we didn't see the, the transition split. And so you can see that either in the raw heat capacity data versus temperature here uh, for different uh, stress values. Uh, or our phase diagram temperature as, as a function of, of stress here. Um, and, and so um, this was sort of like, uh, well, this, this is a, another sort of example of, you know, where is this time reversal symmetry breaking coming from uh, if indeed actually, you know, what this looks like is actually more like a, a single component uh, order parameter. Um, so then, you know, we thought elastocaloric, which is a, which is a nice technique uh, that's been sort of, you know, further emphasized by uh, Ian Fisher and his group, uh, as well as uh, Andy McKenzie's group, uh, to, to basically be able to probe phase transitions uh, when you know they're strain sensitive. So elastocaloric, uh, so the, the idea here is that actually you basically put an AC strain on the sample. Um, and then you look at the temperature oscillations that, that's caused by this, right? So this is, you know, in some ways you can think about, you know, magnetocaloric effect. If you change magnetic field, you get a change in temperature because the entropy changes. If you do that in an AC way, then you see an AC temperature oscillation. So instead of magnetic field here, we're using strain, okay? And so, so basically we oscillate the strain and look for, for temperature oscillations and, and the magnitude of those temperature oscillations actually tells us as we go through a phase transition, about the, the strain tunability of that phase transition. Uh, and so, in fact, here in serum rhodium 5, uh, this is our, our favorite heavy fermion antiferromagnet, uh, you see actually two transitions, first the jump up and then the jump down uh, with applied stress. Actually, what you see when you, when, before you apply stress is basically you almost see essentially nothing. So, so the, the two jumps uh, from our elastocaloric response um, either cancel or have vanishing amplitude as, as they cancel. And in fact, we track these two phase transitions and, and they cross. In fact, this is exactly kind of the phase diagram that we were expecting for something like UTE2. So in some ways, it, it's nice to know that we, we have a probe um, that, that can look at this. But in this case now, this is a magnetic system, right? There's no broken gauge symmetry. Uh, we know that the magnetic structure is an antiferromagnetic Helix, uh, and so this is uh, a system where the spins lie in the plane. They they rotate uh, in in a spiral fashion uh, along the c-axis with some incommensurate uh, wave vector, um, and and we have neutron scattering uh, that says when we see these two transitions with the magnetic field, uh, in fact this this wave vector uh, modulates in this way. So. In some ways, it, it, it bears some resemblance, uh, and I'd be interested to hear, uh, you know, why basically there is no relation to the superconducting state or superconducting analogy uh, that I'm trying to present, um, or uh, perhaps why why there is one. Um, so anyway, so so that's that's an interesting uh, coincidence uh, that I find. Okay, so with uh, with my last uh, five minutes or so here. Um, I wanted to, to present uh, some work on this uh, basically lanthanum or rare earth three cadmium two arsenic six material, uh, and, and this this material uh, is is a real mystery to me uh, right now. So, um, so why are we looking at this material? Um, so uh, there are certainly rare earth uh, based materials um, that that show complex magnetic orderings. Uh, and, and gadolinium, this gadolinium compound here is, is uh, a compound uh, measured by Takura's group where the resistivity basically uh, is not proportional to the magnetization uh, in a certain regime of the phase diagram. And that's believed because this actually generates sort of a, a long wavelength uh, magnetic texture uh, that has sort of a skirmion-like structure. 
And so that's, that magnetic texture uh, provides a barrier curvature then uh, to the electrons uh, that they feel and then generates a, a large uh, Hall response. So when we looked uh, at uh, the cerium compound here, this is a tetragonal compound, cerium silver bismuth II. Uh, we actually measured the, the resistivity, or I should say Sean Thomas uh, measured the, the Hall resistivity uh, here. The green line is the magnetization, and basically so there is clearly uh, a region of the phase diagram here, here's temperature versus field, uh, where there is a, an anomalously large Hall uh, response in that material. Uh, and so uh, we believe that there is some interesting spin texture uh, that is going on here, uh, and that is something that we're investigating. Um, so that told us, okay, this is maybe an interesting kind of structure type to take a look at. Um, and, and so Leslie Shoup uh, has sort of characterized uh, kinds of materials that are, are tetragonal uh, that actually have uh, square nets of the nitrogen atom. So, so here, you know, the, this is now a case where it's, it's arsenic. Um, and, and so our compound actually sits here in sort of basically this is the in-plane uh, spacing of the uh, nitrogen atom and versus the near neighbor uh, distance to whatever sort of, you know, would, would basically help the bonding in, in the three-dimensional case. Uh, and so these are more sort of quasi-2D systems, and then which Leslie would argue uh, these are materials where you kind of expect more of this topological uh, semi-metal uh, to happen because there is a non-somorphic symmetry in this material. Okay, so, so we tried to make uh, rare earth cadmium arsenic-2. Uh, and it turned out that the cadmium uh, actually had a vacancy, large amount of vacancies, in fact, one-third vacancies, um, such that actually uh, the, the vacancies were ordered in a superstructure. And so, you know, the, the original unit cell uh, should be this red one that you see here, but basically is missing a cadmium atom uh, every third site uh, in this case. And so actually it turns out that you get this sort of complicated, ugly, monoclinic-looking uh, unit cell. Um, it distorts the square nets of the arsenic uh, a little bit, but you know, predominantly the, the, the big feature here is this missing cadmium. So, okay, uh, fine. So that's the structure of this material. And then you can do a DFT calculation on this. And, and so since we're working with lanthanum, cadmium, and arsenic, we say, okay, DFT should be relatively good. Uh, and so it's a big unit cell. You get lots of bands. Um, but clearly you have like two, at least two bands that are crossing the Fermi level. You have big Fermi surfaces in this material. Uh, it should be a metal. Um, so you've already heard me say that basically I'm confused about this material because it's an insulator. Uh, indeed, it's not just an insulator. It's a very good insulator, right? The resistance here increases by 10 orders of magnitude uh, as we're cooling down the system. Uh, and, and so uh, this, is, this basically doesn't really make sense. And then you notice here but there is a phase transition. There's a first order phase transition around 280 Kelvin here. Uh, the resistance is actually, if you zoom in here, already slightly on, on the upwards uh, motion uh, before that. But then, you know, the, the tempting thing here is to say, okay, well, maybe you just have the structure uh, wrong. Um, and, and before I forget, I'll just also mention that, of course, we, we made also the cerium analog, which was the inspiration uh, for this. It also is insulating. It also has a phase transition now a little lower at 140 Kelvin. Uh, it does order magnetically at 4 Kelvin uh, in, in a local moment anti-paramagnetic uh, kind of state. Um, okay, so, so now let's go back to the structure and say, okay, well, did we get the structure right? So, so for this, uh, with Kat Kengel and, and Noah Stritzer uh, have done single crystal X-ray diffraction uh, for us as well as cryo-TEM. Uh, and basically, this confirms uh, what we had already uh, seen from neutron scatterings, uh, that basically the structure is, is that monoclinic structure that I described, uh, and essentially there is no change uh, whatsoever across this, this phase transition other than a slight change of the lattice parameters. Uh, and so basically this tells us that it is an isostructural uh, phase transition, uh, and so we have some sort of Q equals zero uh, ordering in this material. Um, okay, so, so the possibilities of, of what's going on here, um, you know, either we have a failure of the DFT calculations, um, but lanthanum, cadmium, and arsenic, there's not sort of any obvious reason. We've done LDA, we've done GGA, we've done scan functionals, it's always a metal. 
Um, could be still that we have the incorrect structure, but again, you know, if it's just a slight tweaking of the structure, it's hard to imagine that we open up gaps across, you know, these two large Fermi surfaces uh, that we have already. Uh, and then that starts bringing up, like, maybe there are some more exotic uh, explanations in this material. Um, could it be something like an exotonic insulator uh, that's happening at T-star? Uh, and, and certainly those kinds of ideas were brought forth for materials like tantalum to nickel selenium-5. Um, but there the system was really a semi-metal, uh, and in this case the DFT, if, we're, if our starting point really is a, a, a sort of large carrier density metal, uh, then it's kind of uh, a little bit surprising uh, that, that you basically have uh, exotons forming in, uh, in that case. Um, or perhaps there's some other correlated uh, states, uh, and, and certainly we would love to hear uh, ideas with this. So in some ways, I'm, I'm kind of left thinking that none of these explanations seem particularly credible, um, but uh, so, so that's why, that's the mystery here. Uh, and, and so I, I look forward to hearing uh, perhaps your thoughts. Um, so with that, I think I'm out of time. Uh, hopefully, uh, I, I presented uh, an argument that generally says we're looking in the right places uh, for the intersection between correlations and, and topology. Um, uh, we have strong spin-orbit coupling, competing energy scales, uh, large Coulomb interactions. I think that, that creates the right environment uh, to look at the intersection between topology and correlations. Uh, and then I showed you a, a variety of things. Uh, so, you know, Examples that we do get large berry curvature effects in a uranium ferromagnet. Uh, the samarium hexaboride has a heavy surface state uh, that gets heavier uh, with increasing pressure. Uh, a cerium rhodium indium 5 uh, magnetic phase diagram that kind of mimics that expected for a chiral superconductor. Uh, and then this mysterious uh, lanthanum cadmium arsenic compound that is an insulator, although it should have been a metal. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for a nice talk. So uh, on the samarium hexaboride, did you get it quantitative? So if you use the carrier concentration, what actually is the effective mass and how does it change with pressure? Yeah, so. That you extract from, say, back, yeah. So I, I guess I don't have sufficient confidence in the, uh, the, the whole measurement just because multiple measurements have been like all over the place in terms of order of magnitude of the hull. And, and as you know, I think the, the samarium hexaboride has uh, the issue with cracks, uh, and and so I think basically, so if you actually calculate what the what the uh, carrier density is, uh, it's it's too high. Uh, you have like more than uh, one electron uh, per per unit cell uh, in in the surface state of of samarium hexaboride. So so at, at that level, I'm uncomfortable uh, saying. Uh, quantitative statements about what the what the effective mass is. Okay. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question about samarium hexaboride only. So the uh, the intuition that you used about uh, the effective mass uh, was essentially assuming a, a, a expressions that we know are for parabolic dispersion, and we are using them here for. Uh, topological surface states, which are of course uh, not parabolic. Yeah. So, do we know uh, uh, what the pressure dependence of the condo hybridization scale is, which might set the gap within which these heavy Fermi states lie? Right. So, I, I think you get a measure of that from the the higher temperature resistance, from which you can sort of get a measure of the the activation gap. Uh, so, so th that's that's the basis that I'm saying that the, the gap is decreasing uh, as a function of temperature. Um, if you're asking me if there's a spectroscopic measurement under pressure, uh, I'm, I'm I can't think of it right now. Uh, if there's thanks. So I have a question about your first material, uh, and just something I didn't, and maybe I don't understand all the different types of heat and charge transport, but you were saying from your kappa xy and your sigma xy, it looked like the Biedemann france law was satisfied, and then you were saying that the Peltier was telling you that you carried two units of heat transport per charge. So how, how are those consistent with one another? Um, 
Yeah, no, uh, that's right. That, that wouldn't be consistent. Uh, okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, so uh, no, so this is just assuming, you know, normal electrons. Um, and, and the statement here was sort of like, yeah, so uh, if you were so bold as to sort of say this violation was, was actually saying that you had charge carriers that, that are, you know, carried only half an electron or something like this, right? Uh, to be able to explain, you know, that's almost kind of naively what it what it would say. Um, but I'm arguing uh, that well, no, that that dichotomy actually comes because this this thing is just overloaded uh, with uh, additional Berry curvature contributions. So it's it's not just kind of a single uh, um, carrier kind of picture, a sing, single band picture. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Actually, can I follow up on this? Yeah. So this. Um, infinite number of nodes uh, <laughs> within 60 MeV. Is that a DFT calculation with the F electrons included? Yes. Okay, so, okay. Good. Yeah, Thank so, you. so yeah, it's definitely, uh, you know, because even at the DFT level, the, the F bands are, are uh, you know, somewhat narrow relative to a, to a P bands or something like that, so. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Hi, so I have questions about uh, this compound and then the next one that you showed. Um, so for this one, so you said that you have all these wild nodes near the Fermi level, but you have also other bands near the Fermi level? Not just wild nodes and those. Yeah, no, I, in fact, well, there's even nodal lines. There's there's two nodal lines here. So so yes, there are, there are many bands that, that cross the Fermi level. Uh, I'm not going to remember the number of bands uh, off the top of my head, but uh, um, so we may have like Five, five bands crossing the Fermi level here. Um, and, and the character of those bands is, you know, the Fs are included in the DFT calculation, so it's, it's part F, um, but it is also uh, some, you know, aluminum P orbitals as well as, as the, the transition metals, cobalt and ruthenium mm -hmm. uh, in there. And then the other question is for the next uh, effect that you showed, it was a different combo, yeah, that yeah. one. Uh, so you spoke very little about it. Um, what is the, you know, if there, there is any magnetic order or not, and what is it? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. Apologies. It's an antiferromagnet um, uh, where the the spin configuration and zero magnetic field is actually shown uh, here uh, on on this Kagame lattice. So that's uh, as determined by neutron scattering. Uh, now we've put it on a field that's canting the spins. Um, the, the magnetic structure in, in zero magnetic field actually has a um, uh, uh, Bayes uh, sort of inversion and time reversal symmetry with a lattice translation. Uh, so basically there's zero Berry curvature uh, in zero magnetic field, but as the field tilts the spins, uh, you can start to have a Berry curvature uh, in, in this material. And, and so that's, that's what's modeled here. So that's why we need a magnetic field of five Tesla. Once we have that, uh, then it turns out that uh, it becomes very responsive to the direction of the magnetic field in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also a system where the, the gamma coefficient is, is larger, and so there is some, some evidence for correlations mm -hmm. in flat bands. So uh, your 115 yes. phase diagram. Uh -huh. So what you did observe is the applied kind of uniaxial pressure and this transition kind of get, you know, broadened, either going positive, negative? Is that what you observed? No, it's, it's splitting. So, so the, the um, so yeah, so I, I recognize this looks like a single peak, mm -hmm. but actually in the elastocaloric, this is a, it's a jump. It's, it's kind of more like a, a heat capacity measurement. So, so this is actually a jump up, followed by a jump down. So these are two transitions here. Uh, mm -hmm. So this, the, the red curve is with uniaxial stress. So this is basically uh, with no stress, you get the blue line as uh, you start compressing uh, in plane compression, breaking the fourfold symmetry, uh, you start to see two transitions emerge and split. Similarly, if you apply uh, tensile strain uh, and so pull in the uniaxial direction, the, these two transitions also start to split. Yeah, but I, I don't think it is the case, but uh, just in case, uh, you know, can you exclude the possibility of uh, broadening transition uh, by pressure 
in general, you know, under pressure, tradition gets you know, broadened, right? Uh, mean, due, due to inhomogeneous distribution of pressure in the LD. Certainly. So, I, I mean, I would argue that, you know, the width of this, uh, in some ways, is the broadening that we see. Uh -huh. We've also applied a magnetic field. I don't have the, the data to show you here, but with an applied magnetic field, these transitions split even further, and it's, it's very clear that these are two oh, I transitions. See, I see, I see, I see. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question to the non-central symmetric uranium compound. Uh -huh. Okay, so you say it's non-central symmetric and ferromagnetic, right? So in, the, in, in that sense, there's two reasons why it could have wild physics. Mm -hmm. So everything you see seems to be governed by the ferromagnetism because everything is anti I mean, follows the magnetization. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you tr test to see whether you still have any component that's really related to the inversion symmetry breaking, sort of? try to look into symmetric in field responses and such things, or even in the DFT level, if you force it to be non-ferromagnetic, would there be well notes as well? Um, so at the DFT level, so, so you're right. So um, uh, there are vial nodes just from the broken inversion symmetry. Uh, that, that's correct. Uh, a different number, certainly this DFT was done with, with ferromagnetic state. Uh, yeah, so yeah. it's an LSDA. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, calculation. Um, but uh, experimentally, what, what I can say is that uh, certainly uh, there doesn't seem, seem to be a symmetric response uh, above the ferromagnetic transition. Uh, so so if, you, if you said like, yeah, But okay, maybe it's just not sensitive enough at, at high temperature, right? So I think you, if, if you really, so did you try to do the, the, the like, like what we do in the 343, we, we, we really see it in the even in field response, did you try to work that out, or so? So, I I would say that, insofar as we did not like do a fib of the sample to get particularly you know well lined contact. So I I would say, any symmetric response, uh, I'm not, I I wouldn't say that we saw any symmetric response that couldn't be explained mm -hmm. just by contact misalignment. So. Uh, yes, we could do that more carefully, mm -hmm. um, but we, we have not done that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I have a question about your last uh, um, mm -hmm. series of compounds. Have you looked at the um, magnetic rare earth versions of those? Yeah. yeah. So, so we, we've looked at the cerium one, mm -hmm. um, and the cerium one is a four Kelvin magnet. Mm -hmm. um, we've also actually applied pressure to the cerium one because, in fact, this uh, um, uh, this T star is, is lower. So the, the cerium has a compressed volume. Um, T star happens at around 140 Kelvin in that compound, um, and we could actually drive the system. Uh, to sort of a, a more metallic looking state, uh, or, or at least basically, it, we drove T star to zero. Um, the magnetic transition though, it's, it's still in the local moment regime, uh, so it actually increases with pressure from like four Kelvin to about five Kelvin. Uh, mm -hmm. The resistive response there looks a little bit different, so we think that the magnetic structure changes. Uh, once this T star uh, changes, but uh, like no superconductivity, uh, which is one thing we were looking for. Sounds really interesting, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think we still have a minute or two. Any other questions? Maybe I, I can ask a question about the last uh, um, mm -hmm. part of your talk. Uh, so you listed all the possible reasons uh, for being insulating for this system. Mm -hmm. uh, well, why is mod insulating not a possibility? Uh, I mean, uh, so I, yeah, I guess I would consider that as, as a correlated possibility, but I mean, I, I guess I just struggle with lanthanum, cadmium, and arsenic to see where the, where the U is coming from in I that see. case. So, uh, but there's nothing in it. Yeah, I mean, should be. <laughs> I <see. laughs> exactly. Okay, but if, the, if the, I guess the question of, um, oh, it's a square net, is that? So the arsenic no, sit on a square net. So there's nothing like a flat band or anything? Um, and so, no, I mean, at least, uh, you know, th this DFT doesn't really look like, you know, 
I mean, I don't know, may, maybe there's some flatness here, but overall these seem pretty dispersive bands. So under pressure, did, did this one go, does this show a superconducting state? I might have missed it. Um, yeah, sorry. So um, we would love to, so the pressure we need for the lanthanum one uh, is higher than we're able to suppress it. So we, we have done the pressure on the cerium guy. Um, but in that case, the, there's at least local moment magnetism at 4 Kelvin. Uh, so we did not see superconductivity, but you could argue that uh, if, if the superconductivity, you know, uh, if, if that's the physics of these conduction bands, then the F electrons are just kind of getting in the way in that case. Uh, maybe preventing this the superconductivity. I guess this one is interesting because you said there are no local moments. That's right. The lanthanum. And, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Right. Thank you. Last question. Okay. Last ugly question. You can rule out that there is surface oxidation or anything like extrinsic. I mean, they're fairly stable. Is it a stable compound? Yeah. Okay. And so and we didn't see. It's like not color. passivated by a stable surface phase or something. So you have high resolution TEM? I mean, we, we do have that, mm -hmm. yes. And so we, we haven't Doesn't seen look like, like some big okay. oxide layer that, yeah. Okay, uh, on that note, let's thank uh, Philip one more time.